Yeah, that's better. We can sleep now. <clears throat> okay, great. Oh, no. Oh. <coughs> that's a bit too loud for me. Uh, thanks a lot for, for coming today. Uh, with Kevin, we spent some weeks <laughs> to organize this event. And uh, we organized it because we had a guest researcher coming from abroad. So Jordan and Ines are here today, and Grayson will join uh, later uh, next week. And because they were there, we wanted to actually talk a bit about cell DNA here at SLU. So what is SLU first, where you are here today? It's the Swedish uh, University of Agricultural Science, and you have actually a Department of Aquatic Science here. Uh, and this is where Stefan Bertilsson uh, is staying and his group too. So we are quite many. I can't count them, but uh, <laughs> we are there. And yeah, with Kevin, uh, we, we organized that and Kevin come from Uppsala University. So in another part of uh, Uppsala. Uh, we are lucky because Amri is funding us for FICA and lunch uh, today. So I got, I get you a free lunch ticket. Uh, uh, and that's uh, very good news. So thanks to, to them, uh, a group uh, in which Stefan is part of. And of course, Kevin and I will represent the said DNA society that most of you know and are actually members. So thanks a lot for joining from very far uh, for some of you. And uh, we will uh, uh, start with that. So we call this mini symposium recovering DNA from uh, sedimentary archived. I hope people uh, online can actually hear us. I think it's okay now. And yeah, if you can just... Yeah. <laughs> I could try. Okay, so uh, first, what is the SEDA DNA Scientific Society? So it stands for Sedimentary Unchained DNA. And this is a tool we are using uh, for now 20, 20 years. I think the first paper was in 1998. People go in the environment and they collect sediment as archived uh, of past changes, and you can actually extract DNA from that. Because many researchers are working on that, we created this society earlier this year uh, with uh, a group of, let's say, 30, 40 people first, and we are a bit uh, more numerous now. I think I will ask you all the time. And here it's a fancy uh, picture about uh, what is this approach? So basically, you go in an environment, you take some sediment core. So if you go in a lake, you will have a small boat, and if you go to the marine system, you will have a, a bigger boat. You can also get sediment from other uh, archives, like cave sediment, for instance, or permafrost. When you have the sediment, you can actually uh, extract the DNA from different sediment strata that correspond to uh, uh, different years of archiving. archiving. Something like that. <laughs> then you can use this DNA to sequence it and to try to identify uh, which species, which organism were present. Um, thanks. Were present in the past uh, using some fancy bioinformatic tools, and with data analysis and interpretation, you can be able to infer past changes in uh, all ecosystem. <laughs> um, in this said DNA scientific society, uh, we have boards, so organizing board and advisory board, and we are lucky because today we are six of them. So Kevin, Alexandra, and I from the organizing board, and Pete, Laura, and Mikkel from the advisory board. But we try to have a very inclusive uh, uh, board. This is not exactly the case yet. We didn't cover the whole uh, planet with uh, uh, our uh, society, but we are working on that uh, actively. And yeah, it's what I just said. We have people from a bit uh, everywhere in the world, and we are more than 260 members now. Many of us do say the DNA. Uh, some are just interested about uh, say the DNA. Uh, I think we are 60% actively working on that. So it's a lot of people. 
if we compare than 10 years or 20 years ago, it, it was not exactly the case. So this is a very growing field uh, now. And in Scandinavia, we have also uh, quite uh, many labs. And here I just put in uh, yellow uh, the labs that are present today. So you can see from abroad, we have Maine University, uh, Wyoming University, Marie Curie uh, University in Poland. I can't really pronounce it. <laughs> Uh, Geneva University and also the Sapienza University in Italy, in Rome. Uh, and in Scandinavia, uh, we are here at SLU. Uh, close to us, we have Scilab Lab that is working, uh, a company working both at SLU uh, at Uppsala and Stockholm. We have also Uppsala University represented by Kevin. Umeå University in the north, uh, the UET in Tromso. Uh, the, museum, uh, the National Museum of History in uh, Stockholm, and from Copenhagen, we have the Globe Institute and the Gus Institute represented. So we try to cover a bit all the Scandinavia for, for this uh, symposium. Okay. So we, with this society, our goal was to provide many tools for the uh, scientists, not only people from our society, but also a bit more broad. So we have a newsletter that is run by Kevin. We did quite a lot of uh, seminar over the last year also. Uh, we had a literature survey that is a huge Excel file with 200 reference and uh, different uh, keywords that uh, describe those research. Uh, yes, we, we had this review uh, paper that I will talk about just after. Some collaborative project, um, but also some uh, working group that I will not describe to, today, but. We, we have, uh, for instance, the Paleoecogene Working Group from PAGES, that is a big network of paleoecology. Uh, and yes, how we start this society is actually uh, two years ago with many colleagues from Sweden and uh, abroad also, we uh, wrote this review paper, uh, trying to provide overview and recommendation. <laughs> so of course, those recommendations will be different in five years, as you all know. Uh, and what was cool in this paper, we also provide the original case study with new data that were not published before. And yeah, I wanted to highlight that uh, for me, from my perspective, one of my first meetings with other Sedena people was in Stockholm in 2018. And you can see here in this photo, many people that are uh, in the board of the society or member uh, of this board. I hope we can do the same type of picture later. Uh, we will see how it ends up. Uh, I'm not that good with photos, so maybe Kevin will uh, will manage that. Okay, I think it's okay for me. It will be yours. Cool. Yeah, sounds good, right? Um, so you have seen all the program before, right? Uh, there's one small change in the program is that uh, Grayson uh, couldn't um, come yet, so he will arrive uh, next week. But we have a gap in the in the schedule, but I think we will just take it more or less relaxed and then uh, we can have a little bit more time for discussions at some point. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. So there are some announcements, but I think people already kept to this quite well. Uh, so for the people online to make sure that there is no microphones on and no cameras on because there was supposed to go uh, quite a lot of people that joined online. Um, in the Zoom, you are welcome to discuss among yourselves uh, during our break. Uh, so when we have a 30 minute break, we will have a PowerPoint slide on the screen so that you know when we have a break and when we come back. Um, if you have questions, for the online participants. Uh, there will be a pad file that Eric will now share in the, in the chat. Uh, you can write them down all the questions and if we have time, we will uh, read them and um, take them uh, in person. But if we don't have enough time, we will come back to this later and then share these, the answers to the questions later on on the website or uh, to some mail. Um, you can also ask questions in the chat function, but uh, we prefer to have it in the pad file to have everything much more organized. Cool. Then for the in-person participants, um, there will be uh, breaks and coffee will be served right outside, which you already figured out in the morning. Um, for the lunch, we actually managed, or Eric managed to get us free lunches. So uh, when we go for lunch, we can meet outside of the 
lunch about the outside of the room here and then we go to the restaurant together so that we don't lose any people. Um, then after lunch, we will have a group photo, what Eric just managed, we will give it a try uh, in front of the room. <laughs> and then after that, we will take you upstairs to do the afternoon activities in smaller rooms um, somewhere else. And then uh, for tomorrow, for the workshop, uh, everybody that will join, uh, we will actually do this at EBC at Uppsala University, so it will be a different location from here. Um, and for people that want to have like a small city walk tomorrow morning, you can meet at the restaurant where we're actually going out um, this afternoon. And then we can walk from there to EBC, which is like 30 minutes walk. So you can take a small stroll around the city. Cool. Um, that was it from me, I think. Yeah. Cool. Then it's... Uh, Are very big, so it may take some time. Cool. The first speaker will be Pete Heinzman as a keynote speaker. Hello. <clears throat> okay, so today I'm going to just give an overview of the entire field as best I can, uh, especially like everything that's happened in the last 12 months, which has been pretty exceptional. And uh, also try and suggest some ideas as where we might actually be going or as best I can in 15 minutes. So anyway, where are we right now as of October 2021? Well, as I said, like the last 12 months have been kind of crazy as far as sedimentary ancient DNA progress goes. So this is only a, a small snapshot of all the papers that have been published. And I've only put, put papers on here that have really kind of like driven the field forward. So there are tons of other paleoecology papers that are not listed here. Um, but, you know, there are tons of these papers and it's a bit of information kind of like overload. So what I'm going to do is kind of like break this down a bit and go over some of the kind of like key developments and then uh, go forward. So to begin with, the data set sizes, sedimentary ancient DNA. So up until this year, the largest data set that was published was the willis Lev et al. 50,000 years of Arctic vegetation um, study with 200 samples from sites all across um, the Arctic. Now, of course, 240 samples across all of these sites is not actually that many numbers, not many samples per site. Um, so what has happened is the number of samples has increased, but the number of sites has decreased. So earlier this year, we published a study of 10 lakes from northern Scandinavia. This one's up to nearly 400 samples. Um, as I said, from 10 lakes, so we've got much bit, uh, denser sampling. And this gives a much uh, kind of like more detailed um, uh, interpretation of the, uh, of, of the region itself, rather than just looking at the whole Arctic. Um, but the field has actually gone even further than this. So it's around the same time that this was published, there was also a paper published from a cave where they actually doubled the number of samples again to the over 700. And this is from one cave. These are from three galleries in Denisova Cave and doing really, really fine scale uh, faunal and hominin recon occupancy reconstruction. So this is currently like where the data sets are. And I'm sure within the next year or two, we'll probably see the thousand sample data set come through. Okay, so moving on to the next thing, uh, sample ages. So this same study by uh, Elena Valer and colleagues, uh, they actually managed to push back, as far as I can tell, they pushed back 
the uh, oldest cave sediment DNA to nearly 300,000 years. So this is basically almost as old as the oldest bone uh, cave DNA. Um, and in a similar vein, uh, Sarah Crump and colleagues, they managed to push late sedimentary ancient DNA back from around 30,000 years, which was the previous record, to the last interglacial, so around 120,000 years. So it's really exciting stuff. So this opens up the whole last interglacial for sedimentary ancient DNA studies from non-permafrost and non-cave environments. Okay, and we've also had a lot of de method development. So uh, this year is really, and this year and last year really when uh, target capture has kind of like come into its own. So we've had groundbreaking studies from Laura Armbrecht, uh, uh, Louise Schulter, and Tyler Murchie, basically using hybrid capture to enrich for d metagenomic DNA from marine, lake, and permafrost environments, respectively. This is in addition to cave environments where the methods have really been driven ahead. But the really kind of like key development that's happened in the last 12 months is the field moving from purely kind of like paleoecology and species reconstructions towards population genomics. So within species uh, inferences. So this was kind of like predicted and talked about in the modern environmental DNA literature literally just two years ago. You know, this was just before the pandemic. So it's kind of like amazing how fast this has all moved. Um, but actually, in our field, uh, this had already kind of started with Vivian Sloan's uh, study, uh, pilot study from Denise of a Cave, where they found one sample where they had multiple uh, Neanderthals by looking at basically um, multiple alleles at sites in the mitochondrial genome. Well, that was very preliminary. But since then, this year, uh, we've managed to reconstruct whole chloroplast and mitochondrial genomes from lake sediments and use these and these were sequenced deeply enough that we could actually reconstruct different haplotypes across the whole genome, not just at a few sites. Um, and then this was published just, you know, only six months ago. But then since then, we have had the Zavala paper, which also did this with uh, mitochondria, uh, but this is from multiple taxa, multiple mammalian taxa. Um, but of course, now we've actually gone past mitochondria and chloroplasts, and now we're into the era of actually doing nuclear population genomics. And this basically, we had like a trio of papers that came out just in the last few months, which have really emphasized this. First that came out was by Benjamin Vernog and uh, colleagues, um, and they focused on Neanderthals uh, from several caves in Europe. And they basically developed a method to uh, look at what mitochondrial haplotypes were present, and they could infer population turnover here. But then they went further than just using mitochondria, and they actually used uh, nuclear genomic information to actually infer population histories and to provide supporting evidence as to which populations these Neanderthals were from. And they all and it fitted very nicely with the mitochondrial data and the uh, known Neanderthal history. But this was only based on one taxon. This is a single taxon, just Neanderthals. So the next study that was published uh, by Mikkel and, and colleagues, um, this actually looked at two different taxa, two closely related taxa, two bears from uh, Mexico. And this was groundbreaking because not only were, were the authors recovering ancient DNA, um, nuclear DNA, um, they were also they were getting it from these two closely related taxa and were able to actually split the data in and analyze the data separately. So they had the short-faced bear and the American black bear. And this is the mitochondrial phylogeny. And because there's a really nice reference database of American black bears, they could actually put this American black bear derived completely from the sediment into the population history of American black bears. And the third study um, this went even further. So in the Pedersen paper, they were looking at just two closely related taxa. But in this paper by uh, Pera Gelaber and colleagues, um, they were looking at three different diverged taxa. So humans, wolves, and bison. Now, all of this was derived from a single sediment, cave sediment sample. Um, and again, just as with the, the uh, Mikkel's paper, 
you can see a definite bias towards taxa like humans where we have really big comparative data sets. So they were able to do a lot more like, for example, PCA analyses and things, which they weren't really able to do for wolves and bison. But they were still able to get enough DNA and they had enough comparative data to actually make some really cool inferences. So that's kind of like where we're kind of up to. And I've really just focused on mostly on caves and lake sediments because that's kind of like my area. Um, but I'm sure there's a lot in microbial as well that I haven't really touched upon here. But where are we going next? So we're going to hit limits, right? So it's all very well. We're pushing the times back. We're expanding the data sets and everything. But we'll hit limits. And a lot of this will be down to taphonomy. Basically, we'll start asking too much of our sediments. And what we'll then start to do is learn actually what can, what, where can we, what's the maximum we can get to. Um, another thing that really needs uh, improvement is bioinformatics. So classification, especially of metagenomic sequences. Now, PIA came out a year ago, um, and this is a really nice uh, step forward. So what this does is it's kind of similar to BLAST, but it's much more conservative in its assignments. Um, but it's kind of overly conservative. So th this kind of stuff needs more work. Um, and also, there's a big problem with at the moment with uh, doing damage analysis from metagenomic data, especially ancient metagenomic data. But I know Mikhail's going to talk about that later. Um, so, yeah. So it's so yeah. We need some more bioinformatic refinements, and coupled with that, um, reference databases. So for genomic data now, uh, there's an explosion going on of available references. And this is in part driven by the Earth Biogenome Project, which aims to sequence a reference genome from every eukaryotic species on Earth. That's a huge amount of data. It's massive. How do you analyze this? Anyone who's run a comparison against just the, uh, the GenBank nucleotide database knows that it can take a while, and it uses a lot of computational power. Now imagine you've got all these reference genomes. How are we going to do it? This is a big question for the environmental genomics community at large, but also for our, our community as well, where we have the specific issues uh, inherent to ancient DNA. Um, and coupled with this, so this will give us reference genomes. So we need to dis develop the algorithms to actually properly process these. But we also need the comparative data as well. It's all very well, this would be all very well for doing uh, paleoecological reconstructions, but to do these really in-depth population genomic reconstructions, like it was done with the black bear from Mikkel's study and was done for the humans and the wolves and the bison from Pera Gelibert's study. It's really, really important that we actually have these comparative data sets. So that leads me on to what will come next is really now we're generating lo loads of data from lots of sites. We're getting quite good at it now. Um, what is going to come next is data integration and a really kind of like nice area um, that's, that's good at this kind of stuff is, actually, is, is paleoecology. Uh, and this was really nicely shown in this very recent paper by uh, Annika Teixeira and colleagues that um, you can basically infer a lot from the sedimentary ancient DNA and you can incorporate paleoenvironmental and various paleoecological proxies together to make, give you a really uh, nuanced and in detailed story of what's going on. Um, and this is going to be important for basically all kinds of uh, sedimentary ancient DNA data. Which brings me on to, uh, we don't just have uh, paleoecological data that's non-DNA, we also have other ancient DNA data. We have paleogenomic data, and there's huge paleogenomic data sets now, uh, especially for humans and some domesticates. So it's, a, it's incredibly well covered. And what we really want to do as well is integrate sedimentary ancient DNA uh, and paleogenomes. And we recently published a review paper basically uh, outlining ways in, uh, as to how we might do this in future. But one thing that's really important if you want to integrate all these data types is to make sure that things are standardized. We all use completely different methods, both for data generation and bioinformatics. And it's really, and they all have their own inherent biases. So it's really important that things are standardized when data sets are 
compile together. And we recently went into this when we were doing our 10 late comparisons, where even though we were using all the same methods for everything, because the sediment quality was very different between lakes, the actual data quality we got between lakes was very different. So that's another thing to consider. <coughs> but we're in the process of kind of like building these resources really for actually doing these kind of like data integration uh, studies. Uh, a really good example is a cyber, cyber infrastructure initiative that was initiated by Jack Williams and colleagues, which hopes to um, basically incorporate sedimentary ancient DNA data into the Neotoma database, so that it basically brings it uh, to fruition as a paleoecological proxy and resource. Um, but from the uh, metagenomics perspective, we've also established a the ancient metagenome directory. Uh, this is on GitHub. And this is basically a directory of all published shotgun metagenomic uh, ancient sediment data uh, that is publicly available on SRA and ENA. If anything's missing, let me know and we'll add it. You know, it's constantly a work in progress, but this is what we've got covered at the moment. And this will be a resource for anyone who wants to do um, big global scale analyses. And of course, there's the kind of like the social communities and part of this is kind of like cropped up from uh, the pandemic and everyone doing everything electronically. There's the new Paleoecogen group and of course, us, the Sedimentary Ancient DNA Society. And this is going to be really good going forward for basically achieving a lot of these goals. And on that note, I'm going to just thank Kevin and Eric for the invitation and for organizing this thing. And thank you to everyone for listening and also doing all the work that I basically talked about today. It's been great, really enjoyable uh, time to be in this field. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't have any microphone, so we talk very loud. Um, we have three minutes of questions if you have some. I think that was a very good summary of the field. Of course, it's like the microbial perspective, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's always hard to talk about both yeah. uh, big and the small thing in the center. Uh, if you have questions online, you can also ask, but maybe we will uh, ask you before if you want to discuss something. <coughs> yes, I'll speak up as well. So, thanks for the for great talk summary. Um, so I was thinking about this, mentioning the next steps, including data integration. It seems that that would entail the same type of challenges that we're seeing in, in more the, the well in, in the medical field or in, also in the microbiology field, of merging different types of data that are you know different in nature and have their own specific peculiarities that needs kind of handling before you start to integrate them. Um, you know, basically metabolome, uh, metatranscriptomes, proteome data, and so, well, is there any communication there, or is, is kind of this field getting inspired from those efforts? Because I, I mean, there's a lot of resources going into those type of. Uh, yeah. So this kind of big data thing, it's um, there are a number of different fields that are going through this. So I personally haven't been in contact with any of the medical people. And I don't know if anyone in the sedimentary ancient DNA field has. But actually within ancient DNA, there's a, another field that has a lot of similarities to this and is also similarly becoming more advanced than that. And it's related to medical. And that's the microbiome uh, literature. So they suffer from a lot of the issues with regarding metagenomics. Um, and the pitfalls and everything. They're not doing the data integration as much as we probably will in the future. Um, but yeah, but there are definitely other areas that we can learn from. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to be a little, uh, I'm not crazy, but it's a, this whole data integration and standardization with everyone starting to use all of those methods, it's going to be I think impossible, just because everyone will use different, you cannot get, I mean, mostly if you talk about the broader microbiome, you think it's really possible to standardize sampling, because that's where it starts. I mean, the method, yes, the data analysis part is one thing, but standardize everyone, and getting everyone to put all the right metadata into the right databases. I think it's, don't you think it's more important at the end to kind of have 
a good tool repository behind it to kind of make the data more usable and better to rethink about the data, new ways to compare the data, to kind of get usable results. Because it's going to be, I've tried to standardize data set, and you do. It's, and it's just going to get worse with the more data that's getting. So it's always very ambitious, but I think a bit of a tight break to do those standardization. I, I think it depends what you mean by standardization, right? So the, um, so one thing you could potentially do, because many of these data sets have already been generated and they'll never be perfectly standardized, is to try and understand the different biases associated with different methods. So the great thing about having the data, raw, the raw data available, is that at least then the analytics, analytic, they can be reanalyzed and that can be standardized. But for the data generation, then this is where you want to understand the biases of different methods and then use that control for that when you're integrating things. But we have to try, right? Because we're generating all these data sets and we'll end up with, you know, hundreds of data sets and we need to combine them to answer our big questions. I mean, what I'm, I mean I'm biased by things I'm thinking about, but one of the things is that there's few things I think on the front end that can be kind of homogenized because every project will be difficult. But I think from the databases, for example, you, you're gonna, I mean, you, you saw it probably by doing those data collections, you know, every, there's tons of metagenomes out there that have been analyzed in millions of different ways. Just simply providing those analyzed in a consistent manner would be a good start to have some kind of comparable things. But, for example, I mean, this is things I'm thinking about, but I wanted to say something, but not <laughs> I'm sorry, I get carried away. That's all right. There's good stuff to discuss after. Okay, will we continue? Thanks a lot, please. This one works too, right? So we will have Kevin talking now. Uh, it's a five minutes presentation, but yeah. Right. <laughs> we will see. And you will talk about capture, capture, barcoding genes from environmental sample. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm Kevin, well, if it wasn't clear yet. Uh, I'm a PhD student of Laura Pudici, uh, and I will present um, our uh, one of my PhD projects that has been um, going on for quite a long time now. Um, so first off, why would we want to do target capture? Um, to start off, um, that this is kind of a, a, a size distribution of uh, any subfield that is quite old. Uh, you can see that it starts with 30 bases and it drops <coughs> quickly up um, um, to 50. So the majority of your DNA that you retain or that you capture extract is super small. Uh, but if you look at the TNL, so for plants, uh, the TNL GNAs, which is really good, it works very well, but it's very short. Uh, because it's very short, um, you can see that the kind of the, um, the size ranges for TNL, even though it is very short, is still quite uh, long compared to uh, the majority of your DNA fragments in your samples, right? So when you do PCR-based uh, approaches, you will not uh, be able to do anything with your majority of your samples. Uh, but if you use target capture or shotgun enrichment, uh, you might be able to get a lot more uh, of your shorter uh, fragments that you can use or capture in this way. Um, so the aims of our project was uh, to uh, really make thing, uh, a pipeline that's very universal, that can create um, baits that are um, um, general, for not only for plants, but you can use any barcode gene um, to produce your baits and do target capture on. Um, we wanted to investigate the taxonomic resolution, um, because in the end that's what we want, right? We want something that is very species resolute, um, and that can be um, much more useful. You can also add multiple things at the same time. Um, and we also want to investigate uh, capture biases and specifically targets with low CG content, uh, because those might be more difficult to capture um, than uh, targets with um, a better CG range. Uh, so the reason of how we did it is uh, we designed the bait set for uh, four uh, very um, important plant groups. 
uh, which incorporate, uh, incorporates almost 16% of all the described uh, vascular plants. So we wanted to kind of have something very broad, but also kind of don't overkill it at the, at the first start. Uh, so we just chose the, the four orders that uh, are very useful for us. Uh, then we designed some wet lab experiments um, and we did some in silico simulations uh, to test the baits. Um, and the wet lab experiments uh, are still running, uh, so we can't really tell you anything about this yet, but uh, it will come at some point. Uh, so we'll talk to you today uh, first about how we designed the probes and um, some in silico simulations. Um, so generally with target capture, uh, you can take any chloroplast genome or mitochondrial genome, uh, you, you split it up in 80 bases or any um, size for the baits, and you just tile it through the whole genome and then you create your bait set. Uh, like this. Um, but we, but our aim is to introduce um, a lot of species, so we want to capture uh, the whole biodiversity instead of just a few key uh, chloroplast genomes, um, mainly because there are not that many chloroplast genomes available yet, um, and barcoding genes are sequenced very deeply, um, and there's a lot of information available here. So we wanted to focus on these barcoding genes. Uh, when we started off with this, uh, we encountered some uh, kind of problems or um, uh, things that we had to think about is that you have a large number of sequences with a lot of uh, sequences that are very similar. So there's a lot of redundancy in your baits or in your sequences that you try to capture. Um, so we wanted to get a, a method where you can uh, design probes that is, uh, you need the minimum uh, number of probes that you need to capture a very wide uh, variation of, of genes in a lot of different species. So the way we did this is we have our bolt uh, uh, as a starting point with all the barcoding genes. Um, we download everything from an order or a family. Uh, it can be any uh, taxonomic level. And then uh, we select the fragment that is most common in the database. As an example, uh, this is RBCL. Uh, and RBCL, there are more or less two ranges that you can uh, amplify a sequence. There's the whole RBCL gene, and there's also RBCL A. Um, so what we want is, uh, so this figure shows more or less uh, the percentage of coverage for every nucleotide in the, in the alignment. So what we want is we want to have uh, something that is uh, present in all the uh, records, more or less. So in this case, it would be RBCLA. But if you ask from both, you will only want the RBCLA genes, then you miss all the old ones because they have a different label, more or less. So we downloaded everything and then kind of selected the fragment that is mostly sequenced. Um, after that, uh, we created a, a gene tree uh, from, the, from the data that we have, um, and we reconstructed for every node in the tree an ancestral sequence. And then from that point onwards, we compared the, uh, the ancestral uh, nodes to the tip sequences, and then we can uh, use just one ancestral node to capture uh, a whole branch uh, in the phylogenetic gene tree. So to kind of illustrate this point is that this is kind of a general uh, phylogenetic tree. So if you take this note of the ancestral sequence, then every uh, uh, tip branch is within 20% difference, which would not be enough to actually capture all your uh, species or taxa. But if you take one note inwards in the tree, uh, closer to the tips, then most of, of all of it, all your branches are within 90% uh, similarity to your uh, ancestral sequences. So if you just um, use these two nodes to design your probe, then you can use two, just two sequences to capture the whole tree, more or less, within an acceptable range of capture. Um, so as soon as we do this, and we have all these node sequences that you want to design baits on, uh, we send it to my baits, uh, and then we get the probe designed back. <coughs> with some uh, filtering and clustering and checking if the baits are actually capturing our uh, targets. Um, and after that, you can order it, and then they will set you a very nice kit with the baits and all the reagents for this. Um, so our bait set that we uh, use for the four uh, orders contains uh, about 4,000 baits, and the input data is around 18,000 uh, official uh, reference sequences and 13,000 MacK references. Uh, so it's very broad. We didn't really reduce the number of taxa based on geographic location, or we just make it as broad as possible. Um, and this uh, contains around 7,000 unique taxa, uh, and we capture uh, 500 nucleotides of the RCL gene, and between 650 and 1,300 nucleotides of the MAT-K gene. Um, so this approach, with the uh, uh, alignments and ancestral node sequences, you can do this on any barcoding gene. Uh, it's 
kind of universal in that way that you can use it on CO1 or ITS or uh, anything. It's not restricted to plants. Um, and you can combine different markers. So you can look at plants and mammals or plants and insects at the same time. You can combine different data sets into one um, capture reaction. So to look at how well our baits actually work, uh, we did some in silico uh, simulations. So we simulated two, 200,000 uh, uh, sequences based on 250,000 reference sequences that we downloaded from um, Bolt. Uh, from these 250, 31,000 were used for making the baits. Um, if you map all of these small fragments back to the baits, uh, about um, uh, less than 1% had an identity score below 90% which is uh, relatively good. And uh, the majority of uh, fragments are within the range that is able to capture with the baits. Uh, we also did some damage simulations, and uh, the damage didn't really seem to matter that much in capturing the fragments in silico. So we don't, don't really know if this is working very well in practice as well, but in theory, it should, should uh, be good. Um, and to look at how specific these baits actually are for our orders, we um, kind of downloaded everything from Bolt and then simulated the data set and then uh, blasted all of these non-target uh, <coughs> orders also to our bait set. Um, and there's a lot to take in in this plot. It's quite big, but if you just zoom in into the flowering plants, uh, the, the ones that are uh, in blue and uh, surrounded with uh, red are the orders that we actually aimed for. Uh, you can see that uh, the homology is quite high. There is some uh, a little bit of a tail with outliers, but the majority uh, are within the top range. But if you look at the RBCL gene, there's a lot of other orders that are already captured more or less within the same range as that will be useful for uh, capture. So although we designed it very specific for four orders, it will be more or less also capturing a lot of other stuff together. Um, and another point to make here is that uh, MATK is much more distant from the um, baits, which is basically because MATK is much better for taxonomic resolution. RBCL is very conservative. And that is also bringing to the next point, it's like what kind of taxonomic resolution can you actually expect from this? If you have like short reads or a little bit longer reads, uh, what is the kind of level that you get your ideas back from? So this is containing uh, the same kind of simulated data as in the previous plot. Uh, so the majority of reads actually go to family level. Uh, but you can get species level and genus level identifications. And in some orders like Pinalis, uh, a lot of fragments actually do map to genus, even though they are very short. So some, some like 30 bases or 40 bases have enough information to actually go to genus level identification. And um, to take into account here is also this, there is no restriction yet on geo geographic location. So this is uh, kind of uh, without filtering out all the species that are not possible kind of in this sense, you can reduce the taxonomic resolution quite a lot. So this is kind of the minimum resolution that you can expect. A lot of resolution at high level, taxonomic level. And probably if you reduce it to only the species that are present at your location, you can go uh, much lower in uh, uh, identification. Yes. Um, so the work in progress is that uh, we still want to investigate our DC uh, bias because uh, in this plot, you can see that RBCL actually has a DC content around 45%. But if you look at MATK, some of the uh, species or taxa have a super low GC content below 30%, which might be a problem when you want to do target capture, uh, where you want to have like a little bit of higher CG content to have a better binding potential. So there might be uh, some problems here that you need to have a good GC range for your barcode gene to actually work or uh, select markers that are within the nice cat, cat range. Um, then we also are developing a Python tool that can uh, kind of create all of these things for you that you just uh, give, like we want to get, capture this family and then we have like a, a, a script or a Python package that can kind of go from input to output um, without being uh, needing to be a bioinformatician more or less to make it as easy as possible and useful for other people. Um, and then if, as soon as we've done all that, we also want to test our base, of course, on real samples and see if it actually works on real samples. Uh, but we will do that too. Uh, so to take a whole message, I will speed up. This is the last slide. Uh, so uh, we have uh, 4,000 baits. This is enough to capture a very massive amount of, uh, of variation. So there is a really good potential to make something very universal with a lot of markers uh, in a very short, uh, small page set. 
Um, it's very universal. It doesn't <coughs> apply to any barcode. So I've said a few times, I think, already now. Uh, the taxonomy solution can be quite good, but it depends, I guess, on where you are and how degraded your sample are. Um, and the web, web experiments will help us understand how to better create this baits and see where the problems arise with biases. Um, and that's the team. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you. That was a bit too long. Yeah, I, I, but that's I, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, do you have any question about the cape? Yeah, Michael. A simple one. <laughs> Let's, say it's simple. Let's say it's simple. Very nice. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, one question uh, about the damage simulation that you did. How did you perform these? Oh, uh, we used Kaganal. Yes. So we just simulated it, and then we took the one without uh, the damage and the one with, with the damage. So it, technically, it has the same reads, more or less. So it's identical, but one has the damage incorporated, and the other don't have the damage incorporated. And you used the missing corporation file from a true sample? Or? Uh, we used the default, more or less, that is okay. given by Gagamo, because I thought <coughs> we needed to have something, right? So that's, oh, it's uh, just interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, with with what you've looked at so far, how uh, could you comment on, on on the quantification, like between groups and within groups, you would get from your baiting approach? To do quantitative uh, quantitative assignments, so. Yeah, uh, I haven't, mean, haven't I really, know uh, it's not there, but... Yeah, we haven't really looked at this yet, but this is one thing that we want to tackle with this uh, in of uh, wet lab experiments to see if you actually capture the same the, uh, relative abundance back after capture than you have before capture, and see if there are biases that will affect this quantitative way, same as the PCR or like, so we don't really know yet if this is something. Um, well, I have some expectations. I guess it will, it will be very much biased towards something. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we have the same problems as PCR, but that's uh, something to look into. So last question before we move to the, to the next speaker uh, from online. So did you check for wrong assignments using your simulated data? Uh, so wrong assignments is one of the problems we have with this because we take it from both. But because we use this uh, phylogenetic approach, any branch that is really out of the tree, we kind of remove. So you kind of have a filtering this way. But it is a, it is a problem, and um, that's true. And um, if it meant like misidentification based on DNA damage, uh, we didn't really look into this that much yet. But in first glance, it really does, doesn't really impact that much the assignments. Okay, thank you. So now we will have a talk from Jordan von Eggers from uh, Wyoming University. And she will talk about understanding aquatic biodiversity consequence of multiple stressors across the Western US. My name is um, Jordan Von Eggers, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Wyoming, um, working with Dr. Brian Schumann and Dr. Amy Christ. And today I'll be talking about um, my planned PhD dissertation research um, looking at the aquatic biogeography of lower aquatic trophic levels in alpine lakes um, in the western United States. So high elevation lakes are naturally fishless, cold, and possess few nutrients, yet today they're being transformed by the introduction of non-native species, nutrient additions, and um, warming temperatures. So globally, the introduction of a top predator like fish can have drastic and long-lasting impacts on lake ecology. And as you see in the um, left-hand side of this picture, fishes lakes um, are host to high densities of aquatic insects and large zooplankton. Um, but after you introduce fish, you see um, that they eat most of the aquatic insects and large zooplankton, 
who are more effective phytoplankton consumers. So then after fish introduction, you see increases in small zooplankton and phytoplankton abundances. I've also included a hypothesized difference in microbial communities between fish and fish lakes, um, but we haven't tested this, but we think this might be occurring because fish could bring novel microbes into the system. They can alter nutrient cycling. Um, and they also could change the composition of organic matter that's making it out to the, um, to the middle of the lake. So this represents our, uh, a top-down mechanism that could change biodiversity patterns in alpine lakes. Um, and so another thing that's influencing these high elevation lakes is uh, nitrogen deposition. So these uh, nutrient inputs uh, can change community composition and also uh, primary productivity levels. And so this is uh, a bottom-up mechanism. And so we wanted to select sites to capture this gradient of nitrogen deposition. So we selected sites in Washington, Wyoming, and California, with um, California having the highest rates of nitrogen deposition, as you can see from this map from 2013. And so the final stressor um, we hope to look at is um, climate change. So um, uh, warming temperatures can change the timing and duration of the ice free season in, in these alpine lakes. They can change stratification. They can decrease conductivity. And they can also affect species with narrow thermal tolerances or preferences. And so we deem this our multi-directional stressor because it could potentially influence multiple trophic levels and propagate throughout the system. Um, and so we, here we also have a gradient of climate um, where we have the highest rates of change in California and lower rates in Washington and Wyoming. So I have a figure on the right here to sum up um, these three main stressors. Uh, so we have uh, the top panel has uh, the different mechanisms, the top down, bottom up and multi-directional stressors or um, mechanisms behind changes in biodiversity. And then we have the stressors going across the sediment cores. And then on the bottom, we have um, starting patterns of biogeography. So our main three questions are how do environmental stressors um, and, or sorry, how do environmental variables and stressors interact to create modern biogeographic patterns? Um, our second question is how has aquatic biogeography varied over the past 500 years, especially during the onset of multiple stressors and lastly, what could be influencing uh, the biogeography of microbes um, in deeper lake sediments? And I should say deep because these only go about 30 centimeters. So here I have um, my study sites, which oh, sadly they didn't um, show up, but I've collected uh, 18 lakes in Washington and Wyoming. And I've listed the analyses I plan to do here. Um, and I'll draw your attention to the main uh, three main ones. So I'm going to use branch GGT lipid biomarkers as a proxy for past lake temperatures. I'm going to look at stable isotopes um, to track nitrogen deposition, and then use DNA metabarcoding um, to look at biodiversity patterns um, through time. And I'm going to look at zooplankton, protist, and bacteria groups. And I've looked at a few primers that I'm interested in here. Um, and I'd love to hear if anyone has experience with some of these, because I know zooplankton are notoriously hard to uh, capture. So lastly, I wanted to provide some preliminary results. Um, I inherited a data set from 37 lakes um, in Wyoming from four mountain ranges. And these were um, sediment cores where uh, 16S metabarcoding was performed to look at microbial communities. And some of the major trends we see here on this NMDS plot is that the first axis corresponds to positions on the sediment core, so deeper sediment samples up to about 30 centimeters. Um, are shown on the right. And then the second axis is separating shallow versus deeper lakes with the shallow lakes towards the top. And this is not a great representation to show the different mountain ranges with the small kind of same colored symbols, but I was surprised to see that what, there wasn't um, major clustering by geographic region, even though these lakes are, uh, or yeah, the lakes are pretty far apart in these different mountain ranges. And lastly, I did a simple um, plot of relative abundance of the of archaea and bacteria, and we do see an increase in archaea um, as you go further down the sediment core, but this is likely biased um, towards bacteria species with this primer set. So I'm really excited to um, add an initial 18 lakes from California, Washington, Wyoming, and do a lot more analyses with uh, this data set as well. 
So with that, I'll um, thank everyone for your attention and thank you guys so much for um, having us out to Sweden to be able to present some of our research and uh, learn some new bioinformatic skills and lab skills. Thank you so much. Thank you. So do we have any questions in the room? Robin? Any microbial question? <laughs> I'm just curious because so you have those dif different sites there and you said you didn't see that many diff clustering but uh, based on the, the, the mountain ranges mm -hmm. but how different is the geology in those sites? I mean, yeah that's a good question and sadly I, I've only been to two of the mountain ranges so I um, I can't tell you too much about it but uh, that's definitely something I should look at for sure. So I'm not for sure. You, you probably wouldn't exp if the geology is reasonably similar you would even though that far away from each other, you yeah. wouldn't necessarily expect too much difference. Yeah, that's true. Too much clustering. That one, so, so maybe it's not that bad, actually. It's interesting that the depth of the lake might tell you more about the type of lake it is, mm. for example, than okay. actually the, the location. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I wonder, since the other lakes are included in California and um, Washington and Wyoming, they're also going to be these high alpine lakes, so maybe they also will have similar characteristics. Okay, so I have a microbial question. Oh, excellent. No, because, because what we heard about this, this morning here was so much about eukaryotes. And of course, they're weak creatures. They can't live in the sediments, right? <laughs> Microbes are much tougher. So that also brings some complications, of course, in interpreting the data that you get. You know, what's living, contemporary, and what's historical. So what's your take on that for, for your data sets? Oh, so at this point, we're um, assuming that all these microbes are living. I think it'd be really interesting to try to figure out if we do have a signal of potentially relic microbes um, in these sediments. I know uh, Eric brought up that um, potentially there's certain chytrids that we know could be present and that um, are in the sediment or and also cyanobacteria that could um, indicate past conditions. So maybe they would also be uh, relic, but at this point, um, it's kind of hard to parse out. So we're just saying they're all modern. Modern, but in deep in time. Yeah, I guess we'll work on that <laughs> over the next five years. Uh, great. I think we can have uh, our last speaker for the first time block with Ines. And after we can go for, uh, for the FICA. And actually, we can just take five more minutes in the FICA because we have a, a missing speaker later. So, all right. And, Maybe we can do that as well. So 
Yeah. 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 showing you this picture. So here we have two uh, rivers flowing into the sea. And you can imagine that the, those rivers are full of DNA. And the DNA will be then uh, stored in the, in the marine sediment. And so here I want to show you uh, where are my, where are my uh, samples come from. So my samples are from the Bismarck Sea, which is a tropical sea. And uh, this is the core. Um, so the core um, has um, uh, 25 meters long. It's a, and it was recovered in 2005. I know that most of people are working in, the, in sedimentary DNA, they have a more freshly uh, core. But uh, we wanted to try, it's kind of experimental work. So we wanted to try, we can recover some DNA from this kind of core, knowing that uh, at the bottom of the sea, the temperature is uh, four degrees. So maybe they could not, the, the DNA could not really degrade it. And what kind of organisms can be recovered um, in this core? And what can those uh, organisms can tell us about the climate change or other things? So just to set in a, a bit of about the climate setting, here in this region, so this uh, the core was uh, dated, and we have some geological um, data too, uh, which allows to know that there is some um, uh, climate changes here and to under glacial to glacial uh, periods. So we can expect that the community change along the, throughout the core, and so the temperature was also calculated, and there is a variation between uh, 25 to 30 degrees, so five degrees changes, uh, change. Um, and so there is also another uh, climate change, which is El Nino. So it means that uh, in this part of the world, uh, there is a huge uh, rainfall, so which means also uh, a huge uh, sedimentary input. So we use uh, DNA metabolic coding, and we target to start by targeting um, eukaryotes because we, at the beginning, we want to know what kind of organism we can find in the core. Um, so, and then we also use um, another, um, other, other um, um, primers targeting for amnifera and diatoms. So all those are very short. To, because you know that the, the DNA are already degraded and shortened. So those are the results from the uh, D9 region. Um, so we found many plantonic um, um, uh, phyla, and what was uh, what was uh, surprisingly we found many uh, freshwater uh, species from uh, Dino Dino Dinophysia. And also some uh, terrestrial plants. So that well, that's why we as we think and we try to get some uh, other um, species uh, from, for example, from um, some groups that can be um, marine or also uh, from brackish or from fresh freshwater. So. Here uh, there are uh, the results from the foraminifera. So we know that foraminifera are more marine uh, organisms, but uh, we also know from uh, uh, five, ten years ago now that we that some foraminifera can be can live in brackish or in uh, um, lakes too. 
so that's why we try um, to um, uh, target for Amnifera. And we found one um, species here on the first layer of uh, freshwater uh, fresh water, um, uh, forum. So, um, but yeah, there are mostly, you'll find mostly uh, <coughs> marine uh, species. Um, then, um, so here is the um, uh, results of the V4 uh, primer, uh, which targets uh, diatoms and also many other um, algae. And so here are in brown, orange, brown color, brownish color, uh, you can see that there is some um, naviculate genus, which is a freshwater uh, diatom. And in the same data set, we also found some uh, um, archaeophyta, which uh, it's divided in uh, between uh, chlorophyta, so most marine algae, and septophyta, which are plants uh, uh, from, from, yeah, from, highland, yeah, from the um, terrestrial plants. So we have, as you can say, um, marine plants, and so which means algae, and terrestrial plants. So, uh, so we were really surprised because um, um, then we know that we, uh, there is some imp river input, so maybe also um, terrestrial DNA <coughs> coming from uh, those rivers which are not too far from the core. Um, so there are probably uh, those uh, navicular uh, diatoms and the uh, certificate coming from just from the discharge of the river, and it was further stored um, in uh, in the marine um, in marine uh, marine sediment, in the marine sediments. So, what you can add for or to just to recap? So, um, yeah, I know that there are many people working more with fresh liquors. So, as I mentioned before, so one of the questions were, were if we can still recover some DNA. And uh, yeah, we could recover DNA even of the um, deepest layer. And yeah, we could recover marine and also um, fresh water uh, um, DNA. Uh, and of course, some terrestrial plants. Um, I know that there's on other types of uh, specific um, primers for uh, plants that could be used to just to um, to compare and just to, um, to decide which, which kind of plants they are. I know that the most of them are from uh, fern or tropical plants, but uh, there are many other of uh, them, other specific primers to be sure of that, to, just to, uh, to, yeah, to know which really, if they are really uh, from tropical plants or not. And uh, yeah, so probably uh, the presence of uh, fresh water and terrestrial uh, um, DNA are probably from the river inputs and can we can retrace some uh, uh, climate change at a uh, short scale. So, um, so thank you to hear me and I want to thank also the DNA Sedimentary Scientific Society, so Ken, um, Ken Eric. And the storage uh, who provides us the samples. Okay. Do we have some questions from you? Thank you. Hi. I have a, a question regarding the diet. Wait. Yeah, next one. I have a question regarding diatoms. Did you get the ecological information from the freshwater diatoms? Like, did you try to extract some information about them? Um, what is it? So, there are some diatoms that are endemic, and Navicula is one of them. Yeah. So, uh, and depending on the species, you can get like some ecological information of the place that they are living on, like uh, water quality, or if it's a stream, or it's like something like that. Um, not yet, yeah, so okay. it would be yeah, really just, just, just to compare what kind of uh, information. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to extract some information about that, you can do like a reconstruction of the lakes that they came from. Yeah. Great. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you. The, the lake or the river? No? Can they also be from yeah, the river? Okay. We have another question about foraminifera or diatom. So I have one. Um, do you think you, you could be able to see the impact of El Nino uh, just on using the navicular proxy on the terrestrial runoff? Um, we have uh, over all the data. So we can see the impact of El We will have our break now. Uh, we can be back here for 11.10, uh, if you wish. Uh, and then, uh, check outside, hopefully. I didn't check, but uh, it's probably all right. Otherwise, just grab a cup and you can have a, a coffee. Uh, and we can start discussing. Thanks. Yeah, you to can get rid of it.
I can also just push the Yes. Okay, just something to check that you hear me. You'll get shy, guys. Yes, perfect. Thanks. Thanks for Start now the second time block. Um, we will have only few talk. I count three talk before lunch, uh, and we will start with uh, Michael Pedersen from uh, Globe Institute, at Copenhagen University, and he will uh, do this keynote to talk about fast function DNA damage estimator. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> Thank you all. I think I still remember the days where I, the community actually uh, was the same number as we are people in this room today. <laughs> and I'm kind of impressed by how many are both interested in working with it. It's, it's a pleasure actually to be here to talk to you. So today I'm going to talk to you about a program that we've been working on for quite some time and which Pete kindly outlined for us is one of the challenges that we have. We call it the meta DMG or meta damage if you just spit it out loud. And it's a fast way to assess ancient DNA damage in a metagenomic sample. So that will be shotgun sequencing data that is uh, the focus here. For those of you not really familiar with ancient DNA or how to shift slides <laughs> there, <laughs> Uh, we know for a fact that uh, in time, DNA is prone to uh, degradation. And one of the degradation pat or, or processes is deamination of cytosines. And what occurs in the, on the DNA molecules is that the cytosines are deaminated. Uh, and it becomes uh, vulnerable at that point, and it breaks. So we often observe, if we, for instance, have our strand here, and we have the first seven positions. You would actually see the C's. Oh, yeah. You would actually have a sequence, which could be action and a reference. And what you would observe is that you often could have a C to T transition on the first positions of your strands. This is due to deamination. Uh, there are traditional ways to assess this. Uh, and we are quite familiar with these kind of plots, at least those working with action DNA. This is from the Map Damage Point Two uh, mm -hmm. program that, that tells you a little bit about the accumulation of C to T's and G to A's on the first positions of the reverse and the forward strand. So this 
we actually use as an authentication tool for saying that this is, in fact, an H molecule, which is very important, I think. Um, so, in principle, we've been doing this in a, in a very basic way. We've taken all the, the FASTQ uh, raw reads, and we've mapped them to maybe a database containing full genomes of whatever you're interested in, and hopefully a little bit more. And what you get out of this is that you get a file with all the alignments that it fits. You've been doing some kind of taxonomic classification based on this, where you set certain different thresholds, and then you get a taxonomic profile out. So you identify the, the species that you are interested in, and you would usually then take those reads, get the raw reads out, and then you would download a genome from the bank. you would index it using uh, whatever kind of aligner you're using, Bowtie or VWA, you would then take those reads and map them against the reference genome using map damage. Uh, you would then up and put this into map damage, and then you would generate the plot that I just showed. Uh, I would argue that this is kind of a tedious uh, way of doing it, especially when you are dealing with metagenomic samples, which can contain up to maybe tens of thousands of different taxa. So doing this could potentially be your, the rest of your career, for one sample. <laughs> so obviously, we, we, we need some kind of tools to speed this up, right? And it's been, I would say also in my case, been somewhat challenging uh, and, and limiting the output. So hopefully, we can, we can find ways to do this a little bit faster. That's why we've been working on this tool called Meta Damage. So, the principles in meta damage is basically we do the same thing. So we take the raw reads, we map them to the database of interest, and we pass these alignments that we get out through meta damage. In meta damage, we then utilize the information already contained within the alignment file. So that would be SAM BAM format. Um, and we can simply take the in the set scores, the cigar, and recreate the reference from it. So we don't have to download the reference, or we don't have to remap the reads. We simply use that to calculate the missing corporation file or the mis uh, missing corporated nucleotides frequencies across all the reads and the alignments. We then use, uh, in this case, we use uh, an NCA algorithm, which is embedded in the NGS NCA. That's a long story. I can tell you that in a, another presentation, perhaps. Uh, and then we actually get out damage patterns and a lot of other information, read dependent information that could be GC content, read length, et cetera. And uh, we can then assess multiple species in a matter of hours, where it would take you uh, at least a PhD. <coughs> so the approach that uh, the principles behind it is simply that we here have a phylogenetic tree, and you can have you can you can actually imagine many different possible scenarios for how your read is actually aligning to this, right? So that could be a very simple case where it's just aligning to one species. Well, then that's easy, right? We just calculate the damage for this. You could also have multiple reads or multiple alignments to that specific species. In this case, we actually do an average across all the alignments and still, uh, uh, so, so the reads only count once, but still get a uh, uh, damage frequencies out. See, one of the issues that we have, of course, in uh, metagenomic samples is that you can have conserved regions, you can have shared uh, stretches of the genome across a couple of species. In the same case, we then use the information in the LCA to say at which level and which uh, which alignments do you use, right? So this is very dependent on how you set the thresholds in this LCA algorithm. So you can set that you want to have some kind of similarities. And that depends on study, et cetera. Um, but I will not go into details about that because that, <laughs> that could, uh, could take the rest of the day. Um, See, what we've then done is that we've sat down, or actually a PhD student at our place, Christian McKinnison, have been working on building a statistical framework for actually saying, well, we might observe these frequencies, but are they in fact also fitting what we would expect the damage patterns to be? So he came up with this beta binomial distribution model that can tell you how likely a fit 
the DNA damage patterns is. So a way to say that, well, you might observe that you have some frequencies differences, but are they in fact also what we would expect in, in ancient DNA? That could look something like this. Here we have the forward and reverse strand again. And you see the dots, the red and the blue, are uh, the observed frequencies across uh, certain taxa. And then we have the green bars, which are the fitted model. From this, we can actually calculate a likelihood ratio that tells you, is this ancient or not? This, is, this looks, of course, very, very ancient and good. <laughs> So let's take an example where it's not. So from the same sample, we've also observed that we have something which is not ancient, which would be very typical for a, a metagenomic sample. You would have a, a mix of both, right? So this would be an easy way to, to, to kind of split these two organisms between and then explain a little bit of what's going on in your data set. Um, see, what we also wanted is that I know that not all of us are heavy bioinformaticians. I wasn't, I'm not, I'm still not, but we wanted actually to make sure that this could be a, a, a tool that could be a, applied by the, the community as a whole. So we put this into a graphical interface also, and actually from the SAM files, you use two commands and you can start your exploration of the data set, okay? Here's an example of uh, the GOM paper, where, which were published uh, some years ago by Hans Schroeder's group. Um, and here you can actually see the distribution. You have the Dmax. So Dmax is a uh, average between the two first positions. So that's an important parameter in, in this. And you have what we call the set scores. So that's the likelihood ratio score. And the higher the score, the better the fit the model. And you also see that there's a trend that the more DNA damage you get, the higher the likelihood ratio goes to. But that you can have also some that don't, okay? Um, see, what's neat about it is that once you, if you kind of hoover over the different points, it tells you exactly what this point is. So in this case, it's a, it's a bacteria at species level. And it tells you a, a summary of some of the statistics that we are putting out. I can't go into details about all of them, as uh, I only have 12 minutes. <laughs> but we're happy to discuss it uh, later on. Um, when you push the point, you'll also actually get the, the DNA damage patterns or the plot that corresponds to that same taxa. Um, and of course, you can click on some of the more dubious uh, taxa and see that there are not that much damage here. It also has a very low likelihood ratio, which kind of confirms uh, that this is not an ancient organism. Or at least could also be a case where we have a very poor reference representation in the databases, etc. So this is of course also very dependent on the reference genomes that, that are available. Um, see, I wanted actually to show you this oh. well here's my uh, can you see? you can't see it i'm gonna okay two six that's my view okay so we this graphical interface works in a browser and you can do it different ways. You can actually do it locally on your machine, which would probably take a little longer, but you would also do it uh, connecting to servers. And this is all explained at the GitHub repository, which we hopefully will publish in a few weeks from now. Um, so what I simply do is I connect to the data here. So this is one way to, to kind of start viewing it. And as I told you, you can hoover over it and see the different plots that, that it would generate. Now, you might not be interested in the whole data set as a whole, right? You might be interested in certain type or certain groups of the, of, of the, of the, uh, of the organisms, or you might be interested in you know, one specific taxa. 
So what I would do here is we put in filters. And you can actually select all the different samples that you have in that specific folder you connected to. So now we leave, we leave it with the subset. But then you can click on taxa. Let me remove samples here. And you can say, I want certain taxa. You could say we wanted there were sailors. So you select that one. And it's going to plug in the two row sailors. So it does it at all levels, right? And the way that it actually calculates uh, the damage at the taxonomic levels is that it accumulates it. So everything that is assigned to Rosales or below is included in the damage estimates here. See, so you could also say that ah, I'm only interested in plants because I don't really want to do uh, bacteria or archaea or the other interesting organisms. And you would sort your data set using uh, this taxonomic path contains function. Um, one of the last things in the filter is that you can actually go in and sit. Okay, now I really want to pass my data set. And I say, okay, I can see that I have a group of ancient and a group of non ancient, right? Let me just remove these here. So I could go into the filters. Let me just take these away. And say, I want to have the DMAX. And I want to do this. Uh, I, will, I only think that the stuff that is around 40 or above looks genuine, right? I can also say, well, I need at least n number of reads for that certain taxa in order to, <coughs> to kind of say that I believe in this taxa. So you say, well, 10 is maybe not enough, but you can do 1,000. And you'll have that data set. Now, the last thing you then can do is you can export your data, right? Which is uh, nice because then you can pass it into your R or whatever you're using and continue with the data set. And what it passes is all the information that is contained. So it's the read IDs, it's the damage estimates, it's the statistical uh, frame that we have here. It's whatever we've kind of the GC content, the number of alignments. Um, <coughs> you can also say that you want to export it as PDF. So now it actually generates some preliminary plots that you can use for whatever your presentation or maybe even a publication. I, that depends on how picky you are. <laughs> um, let me see if I can, I can't see my own. Well, let's just, takes a little while to plot the, P the PDF, so I actually wanted to find one I already, oh, shoot. So in the PDF, it actually gives you some other plots that tells you a little bit how many reads do you have for each of them <coughs> uh, at, at each tax taxonomic level or tax ID for that instance. And it gives you kind of the, the, the different plots of damage, right? For you to kind of present your, your data. See, I think this gives us some great opportunities. Uh, and for exploring your data set, especially temporal data. And here we've generated some damage models. These are from some marine cores that we've been looking into. And you can actually start exploring your data set uh, in depth, in time, the damage. And there's various other, other things that, that, is, that could be of interest. You could also split your data set, say I want to look at differences between kingdoms or other groups of, of, of animals and see if there's difference or plants or et cetera. And here have I plotted uh, archaea, bacteria, and uh, eukaryotes. And you can actually see that in this sample, there's significant difference between bacteria in red and, and the eukaryotes in blue. And funny stuff is that the archaea puts, almost, puts itself almost in, in between. Um, see this? 
takes a couple of hours per sample, depending on the size of the data set, uh, which makes it readily easier than, than most other available tools at the moment. There's some, uh, some tweaks with speed and, and memory that we've been doing, so it also uses less of this. And the, um, yeah, it it's simply, simply outputs all the stuff in a different ways that you might want to wanna have it. Um, see, this is a, not me <coughs> only doing it. It's actually uh, the team here who's been working quite hard at, at getting, uh, getting this to, to this stage. So I want to thank them. And uh, especially I also want to thank Eric, Kevin, for, for organizing this. It's been, it's been great. So thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Do we have any questions? Yes, Stefan. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll start, or should I have the mic? I will start now. So, so being one that works with more living DNA or DNA from living organisms. So this, what's the kind of biochemical explanation for this kind of higher um, damage that you see in the beginning of the closer to the five prime end? And is it the same for all types of DNA, regardless of what organism it comes from? Has it been tested or explored extensively? No, it hasn't been explored and hasn't been tested extensively. And this is some of the things that I think we can actually uh, gain from, from some such tools as this. Um, I think that the, the, the chemical process would be the same. So once you have the DNA in the environment, you would have a, 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 this deamination. So of why the would, cytosines. Why would you have it closer to the five prime? That's what I'm wondering. Well, that, yeah. Anywhere in the DNA molecule. So, so that, yeah. It is occurring anyway on the DNA molecule, but once it's deaminated, it actually becomes vulnerable at that point. So it breaks. And that's why you have them at the, 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 the first positions. So it's more like downstream. Okay, then I guess. Yes, yeah, exactly. But there's lots of other processes, other damages that we are not looking at here, of course. So. I just want to thank you for this graphical. <laughs> User-friendly <laughs> yeah. version of the thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, we tried really... Our, it was, it works, yeah. Well, so we've tried to make it as simple as possible. Of course, there's a, a few commands that, that needs to be, you know, executed in order for this to run. Um, but it's, uh, I, I would say it's something that that we should be able to, to teach everybody, yeah, and, and we would be happy to. So I think the plan is that we, once we kind of are at the stage where we think, okay, now we can do it, we'll set up maybe a seminar where we, you know, go over uh, this in, in more details with everyone interested. Um, and also we can get Christian to really go into depth about the statistics. <laughs> Um, are, are these uh, C to T transitions, like when the DNA damage, is, are they also more frequent in living organisms that like uh, if the repair mechanism, for example, doesn't work so well, that you see in living organisms that there is a trend towards C to T transitions? I don't know, but I would guess that, that uh, the repair mechanism should take care of this. And if not, well, so the C to T is, 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 so it's, it's actually a deaminated C, so it's still a C. But what happens is, once you sequence it, the platform thinks it's a T. A okay, so, and it, that, so it's, not, not, it's not becoming a T, but it's a okay, deaminated C, yeah. yeah. So I think we have to... Uh, okay, the last one. No? Okay. Okay, well, we'll continue with our next speaker because we are, we are kind of late. Ah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it was very interesting. Thanks a lot, Miguel. Thank you.
There is a question online about is it also implemented for single stream data? Is it also implemented for single stream? Single strand data. It should work for single strand too. Yeah. Okay. Should work. But not for use stream data. Um. So now we will have Ida Maria Lopez from Ohio University talking about plant DNA from sediment. Thank you. Do you hear me now? Yeah. <coughs> Hi everyone, and yeah, I want to start by saying thanks for organizing this. I think it's really nice to see some people IRL. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, yeah, my name is Ida Maria Lohel, and I currently am doing a postdoc at Umeå University, northern Sweden, uh, at the Department of Ecology and Environmental Science, and I should start by saying that I work with sediment, but not really Asian sediments. Um, at the most, around 100 years old, but most often only a few decades old samples. Um, yeah, still, I enjoy being here, and uh, you never know what will come, so I'm eager to learn. Uh, maybe I should have this, right? This <laughs> Yeah. So I collect my samples uh, here around here, mid Sweden by the Baltic Sea in an area called the High Coast. It's famous for its rapid uh, land rise after the last ice age. Um, I work in two different lakes. Uh, this one is a bit larger, it's called Nilansjön, and this one is called Kolsjön. <coughs> um, they are connected by a small stream um, and they are about two kilometers apart from each other. Um, they, are, they have fairly similar depth and the surrounding vegetation looks quite similar. It's uh, quite heterogenic. A lot of uh, coniferous trees, uh, some agricultural land. Um, yeah. Also, they both have laminated or barbed uh, sediments, which is quite handy because you get a annual resolution of your data quite easily. Uh, so it's actually possible to just, by looking at the sediment, uh, separate uh, the different layers, although it's not that simple, but in theory. Um, the larger uh, lake, Nilansjön, has two basins, um, which is quite nice when you're planning a study because you have two deep points. Um, to take your course from, if you like. So, um, my project focuses on plant DNA and uh, to what extent, um, extent plant DNA found in the sediment describe the surrounding vegetation. And I'm interested in um, um, basically finding out if uh, whether or not, when you compare uh, sediment from two basins, from two deep points of a lake, uh, if you do that on a yearly basis, if you get comparable results or not, um, in terms of species composition and relative abundance as well. Um, and um, I'm also interested in trying to detect previous changes in land use around the lakes. So here, this is from this summer. Um, I'm standing on a pasture um, where they have been previously, um, uh, they have been cultivating crops, uh, mostly oats and barley. 
So we know which years they have been cultivating crops, and uh, that makes it possible to actually try to, to find uh, those species in the sediment, species or groups of species. Um, yeah, so uh, last winter we were collecting sediment cores um, using an um, ice core. And it's a quite convenient method when you work with DNA because you get the, the sediment core frozen and you can transport it and uh, store, store it and subsample it uh, frozen. Uh, and currently I'm trying to figure out how to get as much plant DNA as possible from the sediment, different types of storage methods. But yeah, it's work in progress. Um, yeah, for the, my main project, I, I'm planning on a quite uh, old-fashioned approach, um, amplifying and sequencing universal primer pairs for, to detect plants, and also to focus or to do a more family-specific uh, amplification to try to really detect those cereals I was talking about previously. Yeah, and I think I mentioned this before. Um, I will also be able to, to compare cores from and um, bars between lakes that are connected. And uh, yeah, we can talk more about that later if someone... I would like to have some suggestions maybe for, for how to, to work with that. Um, and hopefully I will have some results to, to present during the coming uh, next year. So unfortunately I don't have any results yet. It's working progress. Uh, yeah, so thank you for listening. And of course, there are many people <coughs> involved in this project. Eric has been very helpful too um, in planning and so on. Thank you very much. It's very nice lecture. I'm happy you know that. Uh, okay, so if you have some questions, about the Da Maria project. Uh, I will just go out. About valve sediment, I think it's a very good thing to have annually valve sediment. Very good for process. So I will start. I have one question. Uh, do you know if you can actually quantify if um, the catchment was cultivated uh, or not from a year to another? What kind of data would you use? If I know when they have been growing yeah. cereals. Yeah, so there are, um, yeah, we have that type of data, not uh, for a very long time, but for at least the last 20, 30 years, we know which years they have been cultivating which crops. It's, you know, it's not 100%, but I would say 90%. We're 90% sure that we know it because um, yeah, it, it has to do with, yeah, they have to report what they're growing basically on the field. So we have that type, we have that type of data. So you could be able actually to really quantify, to see if the DNA is, can help you to quantify the... Yeah, I hope so, yeah. That's, 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 that's nice. Yeah. I'm not sure there are many studies in this uh, direction with this type of really fine resolution data. So I think it's good. Okay. So, if we don't have any other questions, yes, we have one. I have one. Uh, I was uh, going to ask you uh, how are you going to sample those uh, those barbs? Because uh, I understood that two barbs is one year. Yeah. So, which is your resolution? Like one barb corresponds to one year. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So, how do you do it practically? Yeah. Have you? Yeah, so they are quite thin. Um, a few, they differ depending on the water content and so on, and, and they get thinner the further down you get. Uh, but we do it, I mean, I'm not the first one doing this. This bigger lake is quite well studied, I would say, but not, they haven't used DNA before Eric and you were focusing on microbes. Um, uh, anyway, so you're actually uh, using a scalpel, you're scraping. And it's uh, really, it's nothing I am, I'm not doing, I'm learning, but it's quite, it's really a, like a crafts 
uh, man thing. Uh, you, really be, you have to be able to to know where you are, of course, in the bar, so so you don't take too much or too little or so. But yeah, you can also see each season. So it's not only you know from year to year. You can like see that this is the spring bar, and then it goes to the summer, and then yeah, we have at least we have some people that are really skilled doing that. Thank you. Yes, and, uh, and then as you said, uh, you, you have to take two uh, color valves to actually do the year because the, the brown one is from the summer or green season. Uh, yeah, I did, that, I did that at minus 20 uh, at Umeo. You have to stay very cold, otherwise your sediment will melt and then uh, you know what happened. This is all that when you have a, a normal sediment core with no valve. Uh, um, it's not good to put it at minus 20 and to melt it later to subsample, otherwise it will destratify everything. But here, it's not the case. You stay all the time at minus 20, and then you can really uh, catch those annual bounds. And I think it's very cool. When almost only new people uh, have the skills or the equipment to do that. So feel free to discuss with them, Christian Bigler, Richard, and uh, colleagues, and Ida Maria. Okay, we will uh, go. We have still two speakers before lunch. Uh, so thank you very much. We have a talk from Johanna Melek from the Center of Paleogenetic at Stockholm uh, in the museum, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Is it? Yeah, yeah. it is. Uh, so I hope you will understand me. I have some issues with my voice. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so I am uh, Johanna, and um, my main research interests are. Um, I'm an evolutionary biologist and uh, speleologist, focusing mainly on uh, karst uh, ecosystems, uh, so caves basically. And I'm also interested in ancient DNA and paleogenomics. And, oh, can I, I don't know if I can do that with if right. it's, oh, yes. Yes, yes, it is. I'm sorry. Uh, and currently, I'm a um, Marie Curie Fellow at Center for Paleogenetics uh, in Stockholm in uh, Luve Dalens group, where I'm working mainly on population genomics and epigenomics of uh, cave bears. Uh, today, today um, I will talk um, about a project that um, we were recently granted. Um, its aim is to reconstruct uh, the late Pleistocene and Holocene faunal and human turnovers uh, in two caves from Romania. Those two caves are, is it? Mm -mm. Okay, the pointer, yeah, are uh, located in uh, northwestern uh, Romania, known as Transylvania region. And uh, the caves are actually are situated in uh, the western Carpathians of uh, Romania. <clears throat> uh, we have an interdisciplinary team. A part of the team uh, will work on ancient DNA analysis. We have uh, a lot of archaeologists, given that the two sites are archaeological sites. We have uh, people uh, that will work on geochronology, paleoclimate, paleo, paleo environment reconstructions, uh, ecologists, and also technical supports, given that one of the caves is a little bit difficult to access. So the first cave that we are interested in uh, is Churisbu Cave. And this cave, uh, it is uh, known for its uh, almost 400 barefooted human footprints. Uh, they were discovered roughly 50 years ago, and most of them are today damaged. But uh, at least 10 of them are still quite good preserved. Uh, one of the footprints have been indirectly dated to roughly 34 kilo years uh, calibrated before present. Uh, it was actually they dated a cave bare bone that was uh, two centimeters below uh, the footprint 
and they also assess the, um, um, the cave floor and by comparing the results uh, they decided that this is actually more or less the, the date of that uh, footprint. So we started the field work uh, during the summer. Uh, we started with the first profile, which is currently uh, in work for um, getting the archaeological context and uh, the paleo environment of that position. And from uh, this cave, we also sampled um, um, sediments from the footprints that uh, we found uh, on the cave floor. So there is a cave bear footprint. I don't know how to point that. Uh, and near the cave bear footprint, there is a, this is cave bear footprint. There is the human footprint. Uh, we sampled from there, and we also sampled uh, at the base of a stalagmite that was deposited on, on top of the cave floor in order to establish the age of uh, the position using uranium taurine <coughs> series. Mm, sorry. The second cave, um, it's Toplita de Vida. Uh, this is a really nice uh, cave to access. As you can see, the um, the archaeological site is located here. So to reach the archaeological site, you need to pass through a sump. Uh, fortunately, that sump is aerated uh, during summer and winter. And this is actually the passage that we passed through this summer. And here uh, we have a grave uh, that presumably, presumably has only females buried, but needs, this needs to be uh, assessed in more detail. Um, the three bones were dated to 2.5 2.3 calibrated years before uh, kilo years before present, but based on archaeological context, um, the archaeologists um, gave gave a time span between 5,000 and 2,000 BP for um, all the <clears throat> the position that uh, was found inside of the cave. So we don't have a molecular results yet, but uh, what we plan to do is to extract DNA using EDTA-based protocol, given that the sediments are mostly inorganic, uh, build double-stranded libraries, screen those libraries using shotgun sequencing and Illumina processor types. And then uh, we plan to recover mitochondrial DNA using hybridization capture. As far as the data analysis, most of you are well aware with it. Uh, we will process the FASTQ file uh, using a workflow that is currently implemented at CPG in Stockholm. Uh, we will use Kraken to, to um, assess um, the taxonomy, so to, to, to do the classification. And sequence authenticity will um, be done using map damage, and why not with the new uh, program that we just saw, uh, Meta DMG. Yeah, we will see how that will go. So hopefully we will have nice results. Uh, I would like to thank um, our external advisors, uh, Luve, where we are <clears throat> doing, at CPG, we are doing uh, the entire um, lab work. Axel for his hope, uh, future help with mitochondrial capture, and Pete uh, for helping us with um, um, advices regarding best uh, methods to retrieve the DNA and also uh, hopefully for downstream analysis. I would also like to uh, thank um, Irinel for um, taking nice pictures during field work and Viorel for a lot of uh, support during field work. Thank you for having me here and you for your attention. I'm sorry for my voice. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Joanna. <laughs> Your voice was okay, don't worry. Okay. We want to start. Any question about cave sediment? I know you are mostly lake and marine sediment guys. But... <laughs> Okay, so uh, I will start. Um, you said you took sample from the footprint. Yes. So do you know if it's work well to use actually samples that come from a footprint to detect DNA? Uh, so it's the first time that we do it. Okay. So we remove like the, the exposed part and then we try to like, 
take as much as possible. Like right after we remove the exports part, we sample from from directly from the footprint. But uh, I saw that there are like some um, footprints in snow <laughs> that they recovered successfully. So yeah, we'll see about it. Um, I didn't build rivalry yet. I just extracted the DNA. So I don't know what to tell you about it, but hopefully we'll <laughs> yeah. have something there. And, uh, and from modern environment, because you talk about snow, but then it was mentioned snow. Um, Do you know if people try to catch DNA from people? Uh, what in the... From footprints, yeah. do you mean? I, I, I'm not aware of that. It'd be um, nice to check to see if uh, when you walk on in the soil or somewhere in the sun, you can actually catch a DNA from someone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really hard, but super interesting. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you. I think we will go to the last uh, talk. Thank you. This one. Oh, did I screw on my slides? I don't have any slides. I'll try. Okay, this is nice. It doesn't matter, I can just say. No, 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 I <laughs> Like that? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I wanted to highlight a few uh, projects we would like to do in the coming weeks, months. Uh, in the team we have here at uh, SLU, and actually this team is composed by me, Kevin Nota, Laura Pardushi, and Stefan Bertipson, and we have many colleagues around that help us to carry out our project. And one of them is actually uh, this project that we named Project Ancilus. Ancilus is the former name of the Baltic Sea, because before uh, the Baltic Sea was actually a brackish system, uh, it was a lake. A long time ago, like 7,000 years ago. And we wanted to actually look at, <laughs> at how, uh, yeah, we'll try to. Yeah, should be okay. We wanted to actually look at how uh, bacterial community changes from this freshwater uh, system to the brackish system. The question was, um, do we have a mix of uh, old freshwater communities with the marine entrance in the Baltic Sea that uh, created a new uh, microbial communities? Or did some uh, species actually adapt to the new condition and just evolved in the sense of uh, genomic feature? So we, we worked on that based on Anders Andersson's work on the Baltic Sea, where he, he actually created a lot of MAGs. So MAGs are metagenome assembled genomes that you can create from shotgun sequencing data. And uh, we wanted to actually get some ancient DNA and try to map that to the modern uh, MAGs we have in the system to see if we have some connection or if we have something very different. Uh, and so we have many colleagues in this. Uh, in this project, including Elinor Andren from Southern University, close to Stockholm. Uh, and sh she and Thomas actually collected some sediment cores in 2020, if I'm correct. We went to sample the core with uh, Kevin last year at Stockholm. And we started to do DNA extraction. DNA extraction was OK. We got some uh, qubit results uh, that I show in the next slide, but we will discuss more this afternoon if you want. 
Uh, and since uh, then, let's say we extracted DNA in oh, yeah, November, uh, I have been struggling a bit with library preparation for this old uh, sediment. At two points, we reach uh, the step where we have a PCR pool, <laughs> almost ready for sequencing, and uh, at each time we didn't have enough DNA concentration there. And it was probably due to the fact that we had some uh, adapter dimer, but also some index dimer in our uh, uh, pool. Uh, and so we did uh, many, many tests for six months. We reached a step where we think we know what uh, we could do better, uh, basically moving a bit the ratio between the ligase concentration and the DNA concentration we had in, in sample, uh, but we need to work uh, further with that. This is for that we invited a uh, guest researcher to join uh, at uh, Uppsala to help us doing the lab work. And for that, Jordan, Ines, and Grayson uh, are here uh, to help us. In parallel, we have also sediment uh, metagenome from the Swedish mountain lake, four lakes, and we actually published 18S data on that uh, last year or this year. And because we have the sediment and we have some money for sequencing, we would like to shotgun them also. Uh, we will try that. Uh, Jordan will take care of, of this lab work. We didn't try the sample yet, but I think it's uh, <laughs> there is a bit more humic substance. It may be a bit harder, but we, we could catch something at the end. And the last project I wanted to discuss that is not here either, it's a Lake Econ. So El Econ is a lake close by Uppsala. If you take a map, you will see a big lake close to uh, the south part of Uppsala. So this, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> good. And Stefan. Uh, uh, Bertilsson with other colleagues, including Jonathan Klaminder from Romeo University and Joseph. Yeah, I Yeah, yeah, I uh, From uh, the hospital at Uppsala, they, uh, they are the PI of this project in Lake Econ, where they actually took sediments that are dated 1,000 years ago and they got metagenome from there. Uh, it's a very interesting data set to work on. Uh, Basically, the only thing I had success to do was to get uh, genes involved in macrometylation, that's a process done by microbes, uh, showing an interesting trend over time. So there are eight metagenomes, and we see a compositional changes over time. But there are still work that need to be done about uh, length distribution of reads that we can talk also a bit this afternoon because I'm a bit puzzled and I don't know what to do. Uh, but yeah, basically, those three projects are the one we will be working uh, over the next year, so I'll say again. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for the slide. <laughs> and if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, we'll discuss that also this afternoon. So. No? Okay, so... Thanks a lot for this morning. Uh, did I close the Zoom? No. Um, now we will stop sharing uh, this symposium with Zoom, but we will continue this afternoon talking a bit more about cell DNA, uh, trying to have a quite relaxed afternoon where we don't have too many slides and stuff, but just more discussions of everyone that didn't talk this morning can share what they would like to share about cell DNA. <laughs> Our nice picture from Pit, of course. Um, what we can do now is uh, I will uh, put my stuff in my office, so if you want to, to bring your bag also before we go for lunch, you can come with me at the second floor, and you can put all your stuff with, with, uh, with in a locked office, uh, and then you can follow Kevin and Hyde to the cafeteria. So you all got free tickets uh, for lunch. It's work only for people that are not from SLU. <laughs> So I got only one from SLU, but I think we have one missing participant, so I have a bit more. If you don't have any ticket, you can ask. And the first one as is coming will get the ticket, okay? <laughs> but basically, we go for lunch, uh, and we, we try to be back here at one so we can do the group photo all together. Thanks a lot.